Welcome to episode 22 of Renewing the Conversation, a series of interviews where we talk about renewable energy and heating. Today, welcome Matthew Aylett, Senior Policy Advisor at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BASE. We talked to Matthew about the energy crisis and whether it will have an impact on the government's green and net zero targets, and what the government plans are to prevent thousands of households from sliding into fuel poverty. Before we get started, we would like to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, who are aiming to decarbonize home homes and businesses and electrify heating by strengthening the reputation of the UK's ground source energy industry. If you would like to find out more about ground source heat pumps, please head over to their website www.gshp.org.uk. The link will be down below and don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and please show us your support by giving us a thumbs up. Enjoy the interview. Hi, good morning Matt, thank you very much for joining us. We've woken up to another horrendous day of headlines. We've got the highest inflation in 40 years. Um, households are facing the lowest disposable income um, since the 1950s. It's looking really grim out there at the moment. Can you tell us how do you think that's really realistically going to affect government targets for getting homeowners in this really difficult financial period? To invest in renewable energy yeah i mean it's certainly a really challenging time at the moment for everyone i think uh, everyone is feeling the pinch in terms of uh, ability to uh, pay uh, the increasing fuel bills and of course the the war on uh, war in ukraine has impacted um, people's livelihoods as well access to affordable uh, oil and gas so we are doing our best in in government to try and uh, bridge that gap by providing support for people, uh, particularly those on the lowest incomes, but also accelerating transition away from uh, from, from fossil fuels. Yesterday, as part of the spring statement, we announced um, a VAT cut on uh, low carbon heating products and energy efficiency measures. And that's just part of our package of measures to try and reduce our reliance on oil and gas going forward. Is that the government is trying everything it can to reduce our um, dependence on fossil fuels. Then last night we had Simon Clark, the Treasury Minister, saying that the UK is going to open more North Sea oil, gas, oil and gas fields and maximise our energy there because it's that's what their kind of ploy is to try and alleviate energy prices uh, for homeowners. It's obviously very counterintuitive. We've just had COP26 last year where we were really focused on renewables, the government's really pushing renewables, heat pumps, etc. And yet here we are in a very critical situation. And once again, we're kind of falling back onto fossil fuels again. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope we, we, we don't um, uh, go down the sort of rabbit hole of, uh, uh, of pursuing uh, an accelerated deployment of um, uh, uh, oil and gas, but it's only prudent that we look at our existing reserves and where we can uh, in, uh, increase our dependence, energy independence uh, uh, across um, uh, our portfolio. And I think that's that's only prudent. But to reiterate, and our Secretary of State, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, yesterday was very clear um, that we are doubling down on our efforts to, to reach net zero. There's been a lot in the press uh, over the last uh, sort of few weeks around uh, maybe we'll be watering down our ambitions around net zero. That's absolutely not the case. Uh, and we're actually doubling down. We're trying to accelerate our move away from fossil fuels uh, as quickly as possible. I think recent volatility in the market has just highlighted the urgency need to move away quicker. And we are doing, as I said, all we can to try and accelerate that, that uh, pace of uh, deployment away from away from uh, fossil fuels and towards things like uh, heat pumps. As I said, uh, yesterday we had the, the spring statement, um, which was, uh, I think, clear around the ambition uh, to support um, accelerated deployment of, of heat pumps. But we're also doing a lot of work to try and bring down the cost of, of heat pumps more generally to make them more affordable. So we have a, a, an outstanding commitment to try and uh, reduce the, the cost of heat pumps by 25 to 50 percent by the middle of this decade. Uh, we're also trying to levelize the cost, the running cost of uh, a heat pump uh, in comparison with a fossil fuel boiler by the end of this decade. And partly that's being driven by policy changes to uh, how we, we, we basically tax or 
uh, how we apply social and environmental levies onto taxpayers, uh, onto people's bills. So we're taking uh, really strong affirmative action to try and alleviate some of the pressure that people are feeling on their bills, but also to try and accelerate that move away from, from fossil fuels. I'll just reiterate, we're, we're absolutely committed to, to net zero, um, and I don't think that's changed in the, the, the light of what's happening. But it's only prudent to, to sort of look and explore at what opportunities there might be to perhaps reduce our reliance on um, uh, Russian oil and gas uh, and build a more uh, energy independent state. You mentioned that you've tried the, the spring uh, statement yesterday. Uh, Sunak says that they're going to scrap the VAT on heat pumps and solar panels. That's only 5%. It doesn't really go an awful long way when we combine that with the boiler upgrade scheme. So homeowners are potentially going to get £5,000 to incentivize them to just a heat pump plus the 5% VAT. If you're looking at a bill for a heat pump at around 15,000 uh, pounds, once you've got the grant and once you've got the VAT scrapped, you're still looking at facing a bill of 9,000 pounds and that's just for the heat pump. That doesn't take into account if you need to subsidize your electricity uh, by actually having a solar panel installed to try and you know, ease the uh, uh, prices of electricity tariffs that people are facing at the moment. Realistically, how are we going to expect households to find nine and a half thousand pounds to invest in a heat pump, especially when we've got statements from Quasi uh, last year saying that boilers um, heat uh, homes better than heat pumps? It doesn't, there seems to be a lot of mixed messaging coming out. I know that you're saying that the government really want us to move to clean energy, but it doesn't seem like that is really being translated financially for homeowners. Yeah, I mean, I take the point and I think it's um, well well made. I mean, I think we're, we've got to look at this in the, the round and think about uh, how our policies are affecting people uh, up and down the country and their ability to transition away from from f fossil fuel boilers. We use um, uh, uh, evidence that we gather from, from industry, from market intelligence, and we think the average price of a, a heat pump is about uh, 10 and a half thousand pounds um, uh, at the moment. A VAT uh, is currently chargeable at 5%, but only uh, under certain conditions. And we think the majority of heat pumps are actually installed at, um, at the full 20% or near the full 20% VAT rate. So actually, I think the, the, the savings from the VAT cut are quite significant, and that does close the gap between the, the, the sort of upfront cost of a heat pump um, and uh, the boiler upgrade scheme grants that's being offered. But I definitely take your point. I think we need to, to do more to make sure that uh, low carbon heating is affordable, not just to the, the wealthy and those able to pay, but for everyone. Um, particularly people who are uh, feeling the pinch from the current uh, situation we find ourselves in with the energy crisis. We need to do more in terms of uh, green financing, and we've been plowing a lot of money into supporting uh, development of green financing options. So we've uh, plowed £10 million into a green finance accelerator. Um, the UK Infrastructure Bank has been set up, and one of their core priorities uh, is to, to help with green financing for, for, for low carbon heating. So I think that will all help bridge that gap and hopefully make heat pumps more affordable. Equally, we've seen a lot from industry over the, the last um, few months about the positive steps that they're taking to reduce costs of of heat pumps. And of course, you'll, you'll probably have seen that Octopus Energy are, are planning to launch uh, a new product, uh, a new um, offer to consumers, which looks to significantly reduce the upfront cost of, of heat pumps uh, through a combination of different approaches, but basically uh, through do, doing more process engineering, so designing uh, separate to, to installation of, of heat pumps. And that has significant potential to bring down the costs of heat pumps and hopefully make them more affordable to everyone, not just those most able to pay. Uh, on the subject of VAT, so, uh, you know, the, the VAT has been scrapped on the panels and on heat pumps. Uh, what about batteries? Because this is, this is another very, very strange thing that I've discovered is that we, we've invested quite heavily in an air source heat pump ourselves. We've got a big solar PV array. Now with the, the escalating price of electricity, we've decided to go down, or we, we, we've been thinking about putting a battery in. But we're getting hit 20 percent on that battery purely because we haven't put that in at the same time as a solar system so you're almost forcing people to splash out maybe 40 50k in one shot to get that vat saving as opposed to you know massively build 
their way through that. So was there any announcement yesterday, maybe in the small print relating to batteries? Batteries as a standalone measure aren't included with, within the, the VAT e exemption, but um, if they're installed alongside a, a, a solar panel or a heat pump, they would be eligible. It's an issue that we are working through and we're trying to do more to incentivize people to uh, install batteries, uh, heat batteries, um, electric batteries to try and make their heating systems more flexible. Uh, aside from, from VAT and uh, uh, aside from the support we're offering uh, through that means and mechanism, we are looking at other means to try and encourage people to, to utilize um, batteries and trying to provide more support for those looking to install those measures. And um, that includes things like making sure that those are eligible technologies for uh, future schemes, uh, like the energy company's obligation uh, to try and ensure that people are able to, to use their heating systems more flexibly or uh, to try and take advantage of time of use tariffs, which could reduce the running costs of some of these systems. So. We are doing our bit, but yes, that is perhaps one of the shortcomings of the, the VAT uh, exemption, but um, it's a delicate balancing act trying to, to balance the, uh, the cost savings um, uh, uh, and the lack of uh, treasury income from uh, VAT. Uh, which will obviously impact the, the Treasury balance sheet. So we need to be conscious of, of that. We've got a lot of other parts of the uh, economy which uh, which benefit from uh, the tax system. So yeah, that's a, uh, an issue that we're very aware of. But yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's more to be done in that area. One of the things that we have heard a lot um, from our audience on Renewable Heating Hub is that for the homeowners that have been able to afford the financial investment of a heat pump, winter they have really felt incredibly let down and unsupported by the government in that there they have been almost penalized because obviously heat pumps run off electricity and their electricity tariffs prices and bills have been absolutely eye-watering to the point where we've actually seen families who have been very financially stable who have saved up the money who've paid invested in a heat pump and then for the first time in their in their history have actually been sliding into fuel poverty because they can't actually afford to keep their heat pump running this winter a number of families who actually said we've turned our heat pump off we're just living in in layers of jumpers and scarves and, and freezing. What is the government planning on doing about that? Because that seems that we are really a step behind compared to other European countries where there are governments in, in other countries such as Italy that actually subsidize those electricity tariffs to help and support heat pump households um, in their countries. Everyone up and down the country is is feeling the, the squeeze from the current energy crisis and the cost of fuel. That goes across people using electricity electric heat pumps all the way through to people using gas boilers. I know from uh, conversations that we've had with ministers, this is a, a sort of top priority for them. We are planning on launching an affordability review shortly that will consider how we reduce the, the, the running costs um, uh, of, of things like electric heat pumps. Um, and that will look at a whole range of measures from shifting uh, uh, the, the levies on the social and environmental levies on electricity bills potentially to, to gas or to general taxation. It will also look at things like how we might incentivize further uh, insulation measures to reduce heat losses, uh, reduce heat demand in, in homes. There are a range of measures that we're, we're looking at and that will all be published uh, as part of our affordability review. And our overarching aim and ambition is to ensure that uh, running an electric heat pump is no more expensive than running a gas boiler by the end of this decade. That might not come quick enough for, for people because obviously we are feeling the pinch now. And that's why we've taken some emergency measures to try and uh, help and support households by providing the, the, the rebate on people's energy bills uh, uh, and the grant through, the, um, through, through their taxes. There are measures that we've taken uh, already but there will be further action we will be looking to take to try and alleviate some of that pressure on households. If we're looking at alleviating that pressure on households over a course of a decade, that means that the heat pump families and households have potentially got years ahead of them of fuel poverty or sliding further and further into fuel poverty every single winter. That is not going to be an incentive to other households to switch to a heat pump. Combined with the heavy financial investment they're going to have to make, how is that going to impact these targets? You, As a government, you've got targets of up to a million households switching and investing into heat pumps. How is that realistically going to happen when we've got a huge amount of 
negative press that happened last summer um, about heat pumps. Um, the press are not in love with heat pumps. So that's very, very clear. Um, so we've got negative press around heat pumps and we've got um, households that have made that commitment and they are having a horrible winter. Um, and surely that reputation of that industry is just going to tarnish and get worse and worse and worse. So how realistic that we're actually going to meet any of these targets and we're actually going to grow this industry? Well, I mean, I think we've already seen um, quite positive upward trends in, in the number of heat pumps being deployed year on year. Growth is expected to be uh, significantly higher this this year than it was last year. So people are are, are installing heat pumps in record numbers. Uh, people are generally very supportive of the the move towards uh, low carbon heating. We know we need to do more on the the, the cost of, of fuel and the cost of electricity. Um, our ambition, as I said, is to 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 ensure that a heat running a heat pump is no more expensive than running a gas boiler by the end of the decade. That doesn't mean we're, we'll wait until 2030 before taking action. Um, we'll be publishing our affordability review this year. That will outline potential steps that we can take to, to um, removing some of the, 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 the costs that are on electricity bills at present, um, maybe look at some of the incentives that we can provide uh, to encourage people to reduce um, uh, reduce their heat demand. There are likely to be a, a, a staged approach to reducing those costs. Um, and we're going to try and do that as fast as possible in line with regulation and the regulatory red tape that we might have to to, to cut to, to try and ex expedite those measures. We're certainly very, very aware of the, the cost of, of running a heat pump. Um, and we want to ensure that those costs are brought down to affordable levels as soon as possible. Uh, and I think hopefully the action that we'll be taking uh, suggests that we're, we're very uh, cognizant of the issues that consumers are facing um, and we'll be trying to take as, as rapid action as we can to try and alleviate some of these uh, pinch points on people's bills. Does uh, does BASE publish the, the actual amount of um, source heat pumps that are installed, or heat pumps in general that are installed? Because if anything, when we've spoken to installers, they actually saw a decline in numbers last year. So it's interesting that you say that you're going to be seeing record happening this year when kind of the installation numbers have been to the contrary. So we, we publish numbers uh, from um, uh, things like the RHI, our, our government grant programs, but there are a number of heat pumps which are installed outside of government grants, so through New Build, for, for example. Uh, we rely on industry published figures and the industry, uh, latest industry published figures that we have from 2020 suggest that 37,000 heat pumps were installed uh, in that year. Um, but the Heat Pump Association has said that um, they expect uh, this year, um, this last previous year, sorry, I should say 2021, uh, we're expecting sales of around 60,000. Uh, the, the, the noises that we've been hearing from some of the major manufacturers are that demand has been increasing, particularly after the publication of the, the heat and building strategy. Uh, and we're certainly hopeful with the introduction of the boiler upgrade scheme that there'll be a, a significant growth in the market. And I think that trajectory that we've got um, towards um, 600,000 heat pump installations uh, a year by 2028 is on track. Um, but we, we need to do more to try and uh, cement those those figures and encourage the, the market to uh, develop more resilient supply chains, uh, increase the installer base. Uh, to bring down costs to make them more affordable uh, and to encourage um, uh, big housing developers, uh, local authorities to engage more productively in the conversation around uh, decarbonisation of heat. So there's certainly more we can do, but we're, we're confident and comfortable that we're we're on track to meet our, our, our expected ambitions in this space. It's really interesting that you should say that you know, 60,000 was the number published for last year because the numbers that we've seen are actually closer to 30,000. Uh, and a big problem with that has just been availability of heat pumps in the market. I know that Mitsubishi have been struggling to get it and it's probably kind of the go-to for Essel's pump uh, homeowners that they want to put a heat pump in that like to go Mitsubishi. There have been massive um, supply issues with regards to that. So, you know, I I'm still struggling to see how, you know, kind of some, of, some of the data said 30,000, you're saying 60,000. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm just struggling to get to terms with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you, you raise a really good point uh, around uh, supply chain issues. Um, Mitsubishi, um, uh, they 
have about a third of the market share of, of feet pumps in the UK. Um, they manufacture in the UK, which is um, obviously build some degree of resilience in the supply chain um, with that exposure to some of the, the, the more volatile markets. We've seen over the past uh, 12, 24 months, and uh, certainly there have been supply chain issues, um, access to semiconductors or um, uh, other material components, um, which have been impacted by uh, COVID uh, and the constraints on uh, on sort of uh, manufacturing capability and capacity across Europe. Um, this is not a, a UK only issue. Uh, it's been felt across across Europe, but we're starting to see some of those pressures uh, get relieved as COVID restrictions um, uh, are removed. And certainly, I think we're seeing a lot more supply chain resilience now than we have over the past uh, 12 to 24 months. We're seeing significant growth in the market, and that's supported by manufacturers uh, who we've had conversations with um, uh, who are seeing a significant growth in the, the market and a stabilization of some of the supply chains, which have previously uh, perhaps had um, issues and uh, bottlenecks due to, due to COVID constraints. You mentioned uh, new builds there. You just touched on it really briefly. I want to pick that, that up because uh, what I know, what we've seen is that the majority of these that are being installed across the UK are going are retrofit. They're going into um, old buildings or you know, pre buildings that have been built for many many years. Have old piping, old insulation, and with that comes a huge array of challenges, as we very well know, doing it to this <laughs> 150 year old farmhouse. Um, so so one of the easy, simple things that the, the market talks about regularly is why is it not legislation that new builds and especially big property developers that are put building, you know, you've got really big targets to increase um, housing stock across the country quickly. So you've got big estates going up with hundreds, thousands of properties going into those um, developments. Why are those um, property developers not being told, forced to put in renewables into those homes now? And why is that that those homeowners, are, especially first time buyers, are then taking on a property which they are then going to have the additional burden, financial burden of having to upgrade to a renewable 5, 10, 15 years down the line? Seems like a real no brainer to us. Why is that? And, you know, how quickly is the government looking to legislate something like that? I mean, it's a no brainer to me as well. Um, so, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the new build homes are perfectly suited to um, installation of, of heat pumps because uh, you don't have any of the expensive retrofit costs of upgrading uh, radiators potentially. Yes, it's it's the lowest hanging fruit of uh, of, of the, the housing stock that we, we have or are developing. Um, we are introducing uh, the future home standard from 2025, which will um, uh, put a burden or responsibility obligation on housing developers to uh, reduce the carbon emissions uh, from new build developments which will almost certainly mean that they'll be uh, unable to uh, install um, a gas boiler or a, a fossil fuel boiler to meet their obligations. Um, we expect a large majority of the estimated 300,000 new build properties, uh, which will be built every year from 2025, to, be, um, uh, to have heat pumps installed. But uh, 2025 is a long time away. Um, so we're introducing uh, later this year an interim uplift um, so that will hopefully drive the market uh, and incentivize housing developers to install heat pumps. And we're already seeing a lot of the major housing developers uh, putting out very large contracts for, for heat pumps. I think there's positive steps in the right direction. Um, uh, and certainly the interim uplift to the Part L um, uh, building regulation standards will uh, increase the number of heat pumps uh, that are being installed. But we also need to be you know, realistic that the supply chains need time to uh, develop and mature so that they can support the development and deployment of, of heat pumps. We have a shortage of, of installers at the moment. The market uh, has about three or four thousand um, uh, uh, heat pump installers regularly installing heat pumps. Um, you compare that to the gas and boiler industry, which has around 130,000 installers. Um, we need to do a lot more to build up that supply chain, working with industry to uh, support people um, uh, uh, reskilling or introducing new people into the industry through our apprenticeship programs to try and build up the installer market. And that needs to happen very rapidly over the next few years to meet our, 
our ambitions in this space. That's a great point. And, and just to touch on that now, um, potency of installations is a massive issue at the moment in the UK. We've touched on There's a lot of um, cowboy installers that come through, they botch installations, they leave homeowners that are then left with a system that's inefficient, ineffective, and costs a fortune to run. Uh, I know we've got the MCS that you can potentially complain to, but if that particular system wasn't installed by an MCS accredited installer, there's, there's no way for those consumers to go to to try and get these matters resolved. So they're left pulling their hair out. We've, we've encountered multiple people that have actually just invested in a heat pump, three months later pulled it out and put their old boiler. That's not a solution. So does, base, does this fall under BASE's remit to try and perhaps get an ombudsman in place where we can start to have a regulatory body that can try and assist these homeowners? It goes without saying that the majority of installations of heat pumps are, are done to an exceptionally high quality and we've seen lots of installations which are, uh, are performing exceptionally well but of course there are uh, a number of um, poor quality installations which we we are aware of of course some of these issues are exacerbated by uh, the the rapid transition that we're we're moving away from uh, fossil fuels which are perhaps more forgiving in terms of um, uh, installation um, and sizing. We are absolutely aware of the the issues and want to guard against this because we don't want the um, uh, we don't want the cowboy installers in the the market. You pointed towards MCS. MCS is a good example of where we have an accreditation scheme that supports high quality installations. But increasingly, we're looking at the building regulations to see how we can underpin um, a quality standard for all installations of, of heat pumps going forward through things like competent person schemes uh, where we can drive the market towards um, higher quality installations. We're also doing a lot in the training space, so working with um, industry to improve the quality and consistency of training across the board. Uh, and we're also introducing a new low carbon heating technician apprenticeship uh, for, for new entrants into the market. Previously, they haven't had access to a low carbon heating technician apprenticeship. It's been through gas plumbing uh, engineering courses. Um, so I think that is a real game changer in terms of uh, trying to ensure that we have um, a standardized, consistent approach to, to um, training and bringing people through into the industry. Uh, to work at that high quality, consistent standard. Not only does the heat pump industry need an ombudsman, but also it needs insurance. Uh, mm. We cannot get home insurance to cover a heat pump. Um, and that for the cost of how much a homeowner has to invest um, in a heat pump seems absolutely bonkers when you can get your boiler uh, covered as standard as part of your home insurance. Um, is the government looking at talking to insurers and getting that moving? Because that's something that really would um, instill a lot more confidence in homeowners. Yeah, so we, we are working with a lot of financial institutions and in, in insurance companies to try and ensure that there is a robust system in place to support consumers. So there's a huge amount of work going on at the moment to try and uh, improve the, the, the quality and consistency of consumer protection. Um, uh, and working with financial services providers to try and ensure that they're um, supporting the transition to, to net zero. So we are working through um, organisations like Green Finance um, Investors, uh, the UK Infrastructure Bank, to try and ensure that the uh, financial means uh, uh, mechanisms uh, are there and they're underwritten and supported by uh, high quality insurance um, support or uh, otherwise through um, support for uh, extended warranties or guarantees on products. So yes, there's a, a huge amount of work going on in that space and we're trying to ensure that um, consumers are the number one priority and protected uh, from any issues that they experience with their with their heating system or any other measures, uh, energy saving measures that they install in the home. We've spoken an awful lot about heat pumps. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I really do want to talk to you about is boilers. So the government has been very vocal in informing us the, in the UK that boilers are polluting, they're horrible, they're defunct. Um, and yet here we have um, uh, 1.5 million homeowners in the UK that have boilers that are not connected to mains. So that means that their boilers are either LPG or oil. Now, 
One of the things that we joined recently is a trial on HVO, which is hydro treated vegetable oil. It's a biofuel that comes from a waste product. It does not affect um, food crops. It is not uh, contributing to deforestation. It is literally taking a waste product and converting it into a biofuel. It seems like an absolute no brainer that we get almost 1.5 million of those homes that have those boilers are oil. Why is the government not more aggressively to get those 1.5 million homes converted onto HVO? Converting your oil boiler to run HVO is really cost effective. It's very cheap. It's very quick. It's very easy. Um, you literally just swap out your kerosene, which is a horribly disgusting, polluting um, oil, and you put in your HVO. Um, the government subsidizes HVO in large transport, I believe in airlines and um, uh, that kind of thing. Why is it doing more in this sector? Um, it seems like, as you said, low hanging fruit, it just seems like such an easy, quick solution to get those um, oil boiling homes burning clean fuel now. We're obviously introducing regulation. Um, we're consulting, we've been consulting on introducing regulation, which would uh, phase out um, uh, fossil fuel heating from off gas grid homes uh, reliant on oil or LPG um, from 2026. That's a significant step in the, the right direction towards uh, decarbonizing uh, one of the most polluting sectors of uh, our, our, our housing stock. I think that there are a number of options uh, for, for doing that. Um, heat pumps, we feel, uh, are the primary principle um, uh, means for decarbonizing homes off the gas grid because of the evidence that we've gathered to date. Um, we're also uh, in hard to treat homes which might not be suitable for, for uh, a heat pump. We're also consulting on potentially allowing biomass as an alternative. And we've uh, left an uh, open-ended question around bi liquid, so um, HVO fuels, uh, as a potential solution. Um, I think there are some challenges with, with HVO fuels, ensuring and guaranteeing the quality and consistency of HVO fuels and the sustainability of those fuels, uh, which we need to take into account. But we're open-minded, um, and I think um, we're encouraging people through our consultation, and we have been encouraging people through our consultation uh, to come back to us and respond. We're going to be absorbing that information. Uh, we've received record numbers of um, uh, consultation responses, um, uh, particularly around issues like HVO. Uh, so we'll be publishing our consultation response on, on that shortly, uh, which will consider the, the role of HVO in, in the energy mix for, for off gas grid homes. And do you think that that will be a positive um, move in the right direction for, for homes that do want to switch out their kerosene for a biofuel and burn cleaner energy? Do you think that that report is going to give them something to go on, a bit more hope for them to be able to do that before 2026? Possibly, but perhaps I won't say too much more uh, ahead of the consultation response coming out. Our, our principal approach remains that we should be taking a heat pump first approach because we think that's the most economic and sustainable solution to decarbonizing homes off the gas grid. It's really interesting you should say that because um, we've spent you know, the last three or four months on this trial and I've, and I've crunched a lot of numbers. And you know we're, we're in mid Wales where you would think that there's a lot of wind around and I've been watching the grid since January, and it's been really interesting to see that you know today is another beautiful day. We've had no few days, and we look at the grid and the way that that electricity is being produced. That's all gas. So the fact that we're running the HBO at the moment makes us far more greener, greener than running an air source heat pump. Uh, so you know. Yeah, there, there's definitely a misconception here, here, isn't there? That you know, if you've got a heat pump and it's electrified, and therefore you're running it off electricity, it's automatically mm -hmm. green and clean. That's not actually the case because it depends where your electricity is coming from, how that electricity is being actually generated. Even in the mid uh, the Midlands, mm -hmm. you were saying that when you were looking at some of the data coming out of the Midlands during the in winter, January, it was all oh, well, not all coal, but it was propped up by coal. Yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely, um, absolutely right, and. Uh, I think at the moment um, we, we still rely heavily on, on, on gas, particularly CCGT plants for, for meeting some of our peak demand. I think the important thing to emphasize is that we are moving away from, uh, from those technologies uh, towards uh, lower carbon uh, technologies like offshore wind. And we've had record amounts of offshore wind uh, deployed over the past 12, 24 months we're increasingly becoming more and more reliant on offshore offshore wind and um, 
solar uh, and battery storage. We're incentivizing battery storage as well. And we're trying to, to move towards a, a fully decarbonized electricity grid. And at that point, the, the challenges, um, uh, as you've said, about the, the carbon emissions associated with the, the grid, the carbon factor of the, the grid, I think those issues will, will dissipate um, because we'll become far, far less reliant. Um, and um, indeed, electric heating will become far greener uh, because we'll be uh, using 100% renewable electricity. Well, will nuclear form any part of that solution? Yes, uh, so uh, nuclear nuclear power is a central tenant of our of our energy policy. Um, it's divisive in some cases, but uh, we think that um, it has a, a significant role to play, particularly in um, supporting our energy independence, um, but also as a as a reliable baseload um, a, a source of uh, renewable or low carbon electricity. We've committed publicly to. Um, uh, obviously, uh, supporting uh, Hinkley Point C and having that come on online. Um, we have also committed to uh, ensuring that we have another new nuclear power station um, within this parliament, um, or we get approval for another um, uh, new nuclear power station within this parliament. We're providing support for small modular reactors and advanced modular reactors, so uh, small uh, smaller uh, units and we've been providing support to people like Rolls-Royce in developing their technology. There is uh, a significant role for, for nuclear power to, to play going forward and I think it's going to be a, a vital part of the energy mix. Before we close up, uh, Matt, can we just say, ask you, what is the government going to say to, to homeowners going forward this year? Well, we've got the government is now switching and looking at more oil and gas to subsidize the energy crisis and to try and prop that up. And they're making kind of dirtier choices as a government. Whether they have to do that, I know that that's uh, maybe a controversial um, a debate that we can happen, happen on the sidelines. But you know, what are we gonna say to homeowners that they see the government making dirtier choices? And, and again, going back to fossil fuels, you know, going back to oil, to gas and yet the owners they're putting the onus on the homeowner to make greener choices and to dig really deep in a very financially difficult time and invest in renewables what is the government's uh, message to homeowners why should the homeowners the onus be on the homeowners to make a greener choice if the government is not leading in that way well i i, I hope we are leading in that way and i hope we are supporting people to make uh, cleaner greener choices um, and I think the, the actions that we've taken uh, over the past year, I hope support that, that sort of narrative that we are supporting people transitioning away from, from gas, from oil, from LPG. Um, in particular, we've obviously committed um, a significant amount of, of money, 3.9 billion pounds was announced in uh, October to support energy efficiency measures uh, and, and low carbon heating measures, including the new boiler upgrade scheme, which will be launched in, in May. We are absolutely adamant um, that we need to accelerate our transition away from, from uh, fossil fuels. We are fully committed to our net zero obligations. Um, we are, uh, I, I think, making really significant inroads into, the, into reducing the cost of uh, running low carbon heating uh, and uh, um, buying low carbon heating. So I hope that the measures that we've taken will encourage people to think, actually, this is a, a sustainable choice for, for us in terms of uh, our bills, um, as well as our, our lifestyle and reducing our carbon emissions. I hope that the actions that we are taking do signal to, to consumers that um, uh, government is fully supportive uh, of, of people making green choices. Uh, and we're doing our utmost in difficult circumstances with the energy crisis uh, to try and alleviate the, the cost um, uh, of uh, escalating wholesale prices on, on consumers through our rebate through through council tax and uh, our, our loan scheme. So I think we're, we're trying to, to delicately balance um, trying to alleviate the current um, pinch points that people are feeling with, with escalating fuel bills, but also doing more to incentivize and encourage people to transition away. Great. Well, thank you very much, Matt. It looks, we'll let you get back to it. I'm sure it's an incredibly big 
time um, in government at the moment. We do cer certainly do thank you for your time and for sharing uh, what's going on behind the scenes with us. Good luck. I think you've <laughs> uh, you've definitely got your work cut out for you. I do not envy your position at all. Um, what do I? my own position being a homeowner <laughs> at this time but uh, we've all got challenges that we've got to face this year and, and I really hope that uh, we can see some you know good support coming from uh, for the rest of 2022. Thank you, pleasure.